Buenas tardes. Eh, a nombre del Colegio Nacional y en particular a nombre del doctor José Sarucán y del mío propio, les quiero dar la bienvenida a este evento que es el último de los viernes de evolución correspondientes a este año. Eh, tuvimos la buena suerte de que la doctora eh, Heidi Parker diera una charla hoy en la mañana en la Facultad de Ciencias sobre problemas de genéticas de perro y eh, la genética de los perros, de los canes, y hoy en la, en la tarde la charla final de este ciclo, de este año, la va a impartir la doctora Elaine Ostrander que es una investigadora con una enorme, enorme experiencia en biología molecular, en genética y ahora en genómica, y que se ha dedicado junto con un grupo maravilloso que está en el National Institute of Health a analizar eh, los genomas de los perros, de los distintos perros, compararlos con los grupos hermanos, que son los chacales y los lobos, para entender la evolución de la extraordinaria diversidad de razas que tenemos. Eh, como comenté yo hoy en la mañana en la Facultad de Ciencias, curiosamente los perros, a pesar de la enorme afición que todos tenemos por ellos y la afición que los perros tienen por nosotros los humanos, eh, generalmente no los discutimos en biología evolutiva en términos de eh, su pasado, su presente, y menos aún en términos de lo que son, un excelente modelo de mamíferos para estudiar no solamente la diversificación muy rápida que ha habido en razas, sino también otros problemas como la genética del comportamiento, la genética de la domesticación, eh, los cambios de dieta y las enfermedades. La doctora Strander ha hecho trabajo absolutamente extraordinario, en este campo, muy generosamente aceptaron ella y su colega, la doctora Parker, la invitación a estar con nosotros y debido al enorme interés que el tema tiene, les quiero anticipar que el próximo año también como parte del de el ciclo de los viernes de evolución vamos a tener una mesa redonda con ambas y eh, un especialista mexicano sobre la evolución y la genética del, lo voy a pronunciar mal, Cholos Quintle, que es el perro pelón que le gustaba tanto a, a Diego Rivera. Y lo dejo allí porque mi conocimiento del náhuatl es más pobre de lo que ustedes imaginan. Eh, les quisiera nada más eh, recordar que son bienvenidos, eh, hay traducción simultánea y que estamos compitiendo eh, el día de hoy en la tarde con, una, eh, con un concierto de los Caifanes, eh, que está aquí en el Zócalo, lo cual va a hacer que esté llegando gente constantemente. Y dado que se dan las casualidades, quiero recordar que había una mascota, dos mascotas en la Facultad de Ciencias que llegaron por casualidad. Una se llamaba Adenina y el otra se llamaba El Caifán. Entonces, de alguna manera, este concierto puede estar dedicado a esos perros callejeros que nos adoptaron con mucha prontitud. Elaine, if you please. Thank you. Hola, muchas gracias por esta amable invitación. Soy Elaine Ostrander uh, de los Institutos Nacionales de Salud en Bethesda, Maryland. Hoy quiero contarte algo del trabajo que mi equipo ha estado haciendo para comprender la genética y genómica del puerro doméstica. Lo siento, mi español no es muy bueno. Disculpa si presento mi charla en inglés. Sí? All right, good. Thank you. So, um, today I want to tell you about my favorite animal, which is the domestic dog. And in particular, I want to tell you about the genetics and the genomics that underlie the extraordinary amount of variation that we see in domestic dogs as we look across the world today. To start, I want to tell you and remind you, um, for those of you who may have heard me before, that our lab is engaged in a very long-term partnership with dog owners, dog breeders, dog lovers, veterinarians, anywhere there's dogs, you'll find us. 
We collect and we bank DNA from all of the breeds in the United States and now many international breeds as well. We don't keep any dogs in kennels. We don't breed any dogs. We don't do experiments on any dogs. Ours is actually the largest collaboration that's ever been done between scientists and the general public. And we're very, very proud of that. Um, our original data set came from our uh, attendance at dog shows, especially those sponsored by the American Kennel Club. The American Kennel Club, or AKC, currently recognizes 189 breeds, and every breed is a closed population. So in order to be a registered golden retriever, your parents had to be registered golden retrievers, and their parents registered golden retrievers, and their parents registered golden retrievers. And that turns out to be very important for the kinds of experiments we do. Worldwide, there are over 400 breeds, actually nearly 500 breeds, and we would like to get DNA from all of those breeds in our freezers in the next couple of years. So these are some of my um, favorite breeds. I hope some of your favorite breeds are, are up there too. So three things you have to keep in mind in today's talk. First, all domestic dogs are members of the same species. So even though they look very different and they have different breed names, they're all members of the same species, Canis lupus familiaris. Despite that, breeds display extraordinary amounts of variation in terms of their morphology or body shape, their behavior, and their susceptibility to disease. And those are some of the genes we're interested in understanding. Now, in humans, we study isolated populations like Finnish pedigrees, Bedouins, Icelandic families. The problem in studying isolated human populations is that there's only a few dozen on the earth, whereas in dogs, there's these 500 breeds. And so we have an unlimited opportunity to understand the genetics of anything we care about, whether it's disease susceptibility, whether it's um, coat color, long legs, pushed in face, short legs, anything you care about, I've got a dog breed that I need to tell you about. Now, it's important to remember that within a breed, there's a tremendous amount of what we call homogeneity. So that means within a single breed, the dogs really look pretty much the same. And the genetics that controls their appearance is pretty much the same for each one of these dogs as well. So we say they have a lot of homogeneity. But when we look from breed to breed to breed to breed, we say there's a lot of heterogeneity. And that's because the dogs look very different and not surprisingly, the genes that control that variation is very different when we look from breed to breed to breed. So in a breed, homogeneity, between breeds, heterogeneity. Now, we'll start out just um, briefly by talking about when, how long have dogs been with us? And there's a lot of debate in the literature, but most people agree that dogs were domesticated from gray wolves anywhere from 13 to 30,000 years ago. There's also really good agreement that there's not an intermediate, something that's truly half wolf, half domestic dog, that's been propagated for thousands of years, which is living on the planet today. We know that whatever that or those populations are, they're long gone. But studies in the past haven't been able to tell us very much. We don't know how breeds were formed. We don't know how, how different breeds were combined, especially in modern times, to create the breeds we see running around today. And we don't actually know when most breeds were formed. And so these are some of the questions that I want to talk about with you tonight. So in order to address those questions, we've undertaken something called SNP-based population studies. So what is a SNP? Well, you see that word in, in the literature, in the popular press, in the magazines. It stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. 
And all it means is that there's a place in the DNA sequence where there's variation between individuals. And there are millions of such places. What we've done is we've made little chips that look like this, and every chip has 170,000 SNPs that we're gonna test on every single dog that we're interested in. So we're gonna look at 161 breeds and every SNP has two possible combinations. It's what you got from mom and what you got from dad. So we're gonna look at 161 breeds as well as some wolves and some golden jackals. If you were to come to my lab, you would find tons of these in the garbage can because we go through thousands of them every year. And if you had a magnifying glass and you could look very closely, this is really what you'd see. Everywhere there's a little green line, there's a snip that we're going to test. Dogs have 38 chromosomes, pairs of chromosomes, and these are all the 170,000 SNPs going up and down the chromosomes that we're interested in looking at today. All right, so this is what we call the wheel of life for us. So most biologists think about a wheel of life or a tree of life, everything from bacteria to humans. But when we think about a, a tree of life, what we think about is domestic dog breeds. So what we've done in this experiment is we've taken over a thousand dogs, we've gotten blood samples from them, and we've isolated DNA. And then we've tested that DNA with our SNP chip, and then what we've done is we've used that data to divide those 161 breeds into families. And the color coding tells you what the families are. So over here, I know it's very hard to read the names of breeds, but over here are English Springer Spaniels, Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, American Cocker Spaniels, Field Spaniels, and English Cocker Spaniels. So the, the groupings really make sense. Now we use this in order to develop our tests and our hypotheses and our experiments. So for instance, let's say I was interested in a disease that occurs in the French Bulldog and I was equally interested in the same disease that occurred in the Bull Terrier, the Miniature Bull Terrier, the Boxer. Well, those are all in this same family. So I could reasonably say that whatever's causing the disease in the French Bulldog, well, there's probably a mutation in that same gene in all those other breeds causing the same disease because they share a recent common ancestor. Now, let's say this is a complex disease like epilepsy. Well, lots of different, different populations of people get it and lots of different dog breeds get it. So I'm also gonna study, study it in the terriers. Here's the Scottish Terrier, and I can hypothesize that dogs with epilepsy who are also Cairn Terriers, Norfolk Terriers, Norwich Terriers, et cetera, that they all got the disease because they also inherited a mutation from a recent common ancestor because all, they're all this light blue color. But what's causing the disease in the terriers is going to be different than what's causing the disease at the other side of the wheel in those bull terrier, bully dog breeds, the, the, the bull mastiffs and the French bulldogs. So we can use this as a way to identify multiple genes responsible for a single trait by taking advantage of this family structure. Now we can use the same data to ask how are individual breeds established? Well, we know dogs were domesticated only about 15, 30,000 years ago, but most dog breeds have only been around since Victorian times, so a really, really tiny amount of time. So how were these breeds established? How did this even happen? Well, in order to figure that out, we use something called haplotype analysis. So a haplotype is just a group of DNA variants, like those SNPs I told you about, that are inherited together from one parent. Now this should make sense. If we look within a breed, then we're gonna see a lot more sharing of haplotypes. Lots of individuals are gonna have the same pattern of variation. If we look within families or clades, it's gonna be less than what we saw within a breed, but it's gonna be even less than that if we look in different families or different clades. 
so we can use that data to figure out how the different dog breeds relate one to another. In an experiment that took us two years, we've done exactly that. And this is the figure I'm going to show you here. So this is a very busy figure, and I apologize. I know you can't read it. But it's the same families or clades that we showed in the previous slide. It's the same color coding that you saw before. So the terriers are, are, are actually up here, um, and those French bulldogs are down over here. And what these ribbons are telling you is where there's been genetic sharing in the creation of various breeds. So you can see lots and lots of ribbons telling us that there's lots and lots of places where sharing has occurred 100, 200, 300 years ago in the creation of those particular breeds. Now it's hard to read this, so let's break it down a little bit and let's look here at terriers. Well, here's the Kerry Blue Terrier and the Border Terrier and the Scottish Terrier. And we can see that they've done a lot of sharing all the way across the, that terrier family in order to create the terrier breeds that we know today. And there are over a dozen terriers and all these blue lines swinging back and forth tell us breeders did a lot of mixing and matching to get the dogs that we recognize today. But they also mixed and matched elsewhere on the wheel. So for instance, there's been some mixing and matching over here with that boxer and that bulldog group or family. There's been some mixing and matching over here. These are herding dogs. And then as well, some over here. Um, and these are some of the hounds. And does that make sense? Well, yeah, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, it actually makes pretty good sense. Now we can take that data and we can put it all together and we can figure out when things happened. So over here on this line, I'm telling you how many millions of base pairs are shared. And down here, I'm telling you how many years ago things happened. So the Norwich and the Norfolk Terriers became separate breeds only about 30 years ago. The Eurasia developed with a Chow Chow cross. Well, that was about 50 years ago. We all know that the big breeds, like the Irish Wolfhound, um, were pretty decimated during World War II. So the Irish Wolfhound was recovered using Scottish Deerhounds, which were crossed with Great Danes. And we could even tell pretty old things that are complex, like the Bulldog, the French Bulldog, and the American Staffordshire Terrier were mixed together 150 years ago to create the Boston Terrier. So now we have a lot of knowledge now about how and when different dog breeds were created and what was mixed and matched in order to do that. So let's talk a little bit more about one of my favorite groups. These are the herding breeds. Now there are, are really, um, oh, maybe five different groups of herding dogs that were developed at slightly different points in time for different purposes. So there are the UK dogs. Um, there are continental dogs like the Belgian Sheepdog, the Belgian Malinois, and the Belgian Tavern. There are the Italian dogs like the Dog de Bordeaux, for instance. Um, there are a couple of Hungarian breeds, the Puli and the Pumi. And then over here, there are also these Nordic breeds going between Iceland and places like Norway. Now, they look pretty separate, but there actually has been a little bit of mixing and matching in the modern terrier, in the modern herding breeds as we see them today. So over here we have the, the border collie, and so that's going to be in the same group as other breeds like the collies and the Shetland sheepdogs. Over here are the Hungarians, the Puli, the Pumi. Um, here is the German Shepherd, and then down here is the Briard. So they're in very pretty separate places in the wheel, but especially going here to here, there's been a little bit of mixing and matching. Now, how can we use that to help the National Institutes of Health find disease genes? Because they care a lot about that. They want to understand the genetics of disease. So we'll talk about one example, and that's the example of Kali eye anomaly. So collie eye anomaly, it's a recessive disease. Um, it's reminiscent of several human disorders. So the optic vesicles in the eye don't express growth hormone. So other eye cells don't grow correctly. 
and you get a lot of things like the retina detaches, the sclera pits, and the choroid actually kind of shrinks and gets hypoplastic. Now, we first um, began studying this disease in the 1990s, and it's because it was very common in collies and in border collies. Now, border collies are herding dogs, so if you lose your vision, that's gonna be really bad, right? You're not gonna be able to find the sheep. So we really wanted to understand the genetics of this disease much better. And now that we know about how all these breeds were formed, we actually understand this disease and the genes incredibly well. So the disease starts over here with the good old collie, and he generously shares it with the border collie, the old English sheepdog, and all of these other herding dogs. Now we also see the disease in the Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever, we never knew why, but now we do, because there's been some mixing between the herding breeds and the Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever. We also see it over here in the Chinook. That never made sense, uh, but now it does, because these dogs have generously contributed good DNA as well as bad DNA to the Chinook. And if I were a veterinarian, I'd be watching closely the Airedale Terrier, the Pug, the Boykin Spaniel, because these are all breeds that have shared with this cluster here and are hence at risk for getting the disease. So we do those kinds of experiments a lot, and I could spend the entire hour just talking about diseases and how we use single breeds, breed families, and then how we use this wheel of information to actually identify genes responsible for disease. But I wanna cover a couple of different topics, and so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here. And we've talked here all about purebred dogs. And one of the questions I get asked most often is, what about mixed breed dogs? How come you never tell us anything about mixed breed dogs? Well, today I'm gonna to tell you about mixed breed dogs. And the reason is because we can use the very same data that we collected before on purebred dogs to figure out things like what are the breeds that got joined together to make your mixed breed dog or your mutt or your mutt or your mutt. And we've been doing that pretty successfully. So let me show you some examples. The first thing we did is we've looked at a number of mutts or mixed breed dogs for whom we know their underlying genetics. So this is sort of a test case. So this is Millie. She is a golden doodle. She's part golden retriever and part poodle. Now, when we analyze her DNA, it looks like this. And I know this is very hard for you to make sense of because you can't read anything I've written down here. It's actually just those same 160 breeds. They're in the same order. And all you really need to know is that there are a couple of peaks. There's one over here telling us she's part poodle, and there's one over here telling us she's part golden retriever. So, great, golden doodle, makes sense, a very good uh, starting place. And we've done lots of others like this where we know the right answer to make sure our methods work well. So now here are some test cases that are kind of fun. This is Hannah, what do you think Hannah is? Some kind of husky, Nordic breed, something like that? All right, well, Hannah is certainly part that, but she's also part some other things. So she is mostly Siberian Husky, but she's also part Malamute, and she's also part German Shepherd. So if we calculate the numbers and we draw her pedigree out, it looks like this. Here's Hannah. She's 88% Siberian Husky. So you got it right if you said Siberian Husky. She's got 12% Malamute and a teeny tiny little dollop of German Shepherd. So most everybody in her pedigree was Siberian Husky. But somewhere right around here, a Malamute got crossed in, and somewhere way back here, somebody put a little German Shepherd in there. So that's Hannah, and that makes sense. We look at her and we say, she looks like what we say. Now this is Geo. What do you think Geo is? Shetland Sheepdog, right? Well, I kind of hope she's a Shetland Sheepdog because a friend of mine paid a lot of money for Geo. And she was told Geo was a purebred Shetland Sheepdog. Is Geo a purebred Shetland Sheepdog? No, Geo is not a purebred Shetland Sheepdog. So Geo has a couple of other things in her. 
she has some Samoyed, and she has some American Eskimo dog. To, to, be, to be truthful, Geo really is mostly Shetland Sheepdog. She's 97% Shetland Sheepdog. But now that we have these DNA tests, much like Ancestry.com, we can tell you the littlest things that have happened years and years and generations and generations ago. So somewhere back around here, there was a cross of a Samoyed and an American Eskimo dog. And you can see that there's just been this propagation of a little bit, a little bit, a little bit going all the way through until we look at Geo's parents. And on this side, yep, they're all Shetland Sheepdog. And over here, they're mostly Shetland Sheepdog, but she still carries a couple percent of Samoyed and 1% of American Eskimo dog. So she wasn't, as advertised, truly purebred. Hmm, interesting. Okay, now here's Eddie. You gotta love Eddie, right? Eddie's just a short, small, black-legged dog. What breeds do you think Eddie is? Oh, some good, good, uh, good calls out there. So Eddie is a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> Eddie is truly, truly a mutt. So Eddie is part American Eskimo dog. He's part um, Cocker Spaniel. He's part Rat Terrier. Sorry, Cocker Spaniel. He is part Pekingese. He's part German Shepherd. Um, he's part a little bit of everything. So here's what Eddie actually looks like in terms of his pedigree. He's 54% American Eskimo dog, okay? But then he's 26% Cocker Spaniel, 10% Rat Terrier, 4% Toy Poodle, 3% Pekingese, and German Shepherd. Now, somebody would look at this and say, really, really, are you sure that's right? Well, you're distracted. Your eye is distracting you because you're thinking, well, he's black and the American Eskimo dog is white. And that's certainly true, but the poodle is black and the Cocker Spaniel can be black. And you're saying he's got, you know, these really short legs. Um, I don't know, the American Eskimo dog doesn't have really short legs. Yeah, that's true, but the Pekingese really does. And he has short hair. And, and, and look at the Eskimo dog. It has this really beautiful long hair. But yeah, but you know what? He's got some rat terrier in him. And that's probably where the short hair comes from. So much like your own pedigree is a mixture of surprises, it's a surprise for these dogs too. And they don't always have the genetic background that you might think if you just fixate on one or two traits. Now this is my last example. This is Ice Princess. What do you think Ice Princess is? Ice Princess is, turns out to be a huge surprise because when we tested her, she wasn't a mixed breed dog. She was a purebred. In fact, she was a purebred beaver terrier. Actually pronounced beaver terriers like the beavers, right? So when we found that, I kind of panicked because this dog had been given to us to test as a mutt, as a mixed breed dog. And no matter how many times we tested her, she came out as a purebred beaver terrier. And that made no sense. Those dogs are very rare in the United States. You find them in Germany. But gosh, look, this is a pretty clear and clean signal. And, and you know, we even had one beaver terrier in our data set, and she was right here with that beaver terrier. So I finally called up the owner, and I said, um, you know, this is kind of weird. I don't really think it's a mud. I actually think it's a purebred beaver terrier. And she said, really? Because my sister got her when she was stationed in Germany. It was a dog her sister had rescued in Germany, which then again made perfect, perfect sense. Now, if you take her dog and you give it a bath, it actually looks an awful lot like a beaver terrier. So again, lots of surprises, and, and sometimes we even find these rare purebred dogs. Now, one of the things people always ask me when I start talking about purebred versus mixed breed dogs is about behavior. And they say, you know, my dog does this. Do you think they got that from the Labrador in them, from the Poodle in them? from the Cocker Spaniel in them, from the Chihuahua in them? Why does my dog behave the way that it does? So behavior is very difficult to study because we don't have good assays. It's very hard to go out and, and get a bunch of dogs and test them for a behavior and then come up with a score. But 
Jamin Kim in my lab has been interested in doing just that. So Jamin decided to start his experiments by comparing the genomes of sport hunting dogs. So these are dogs that point, they're retrievers, they flush, they're very active, they're very athletic. And on the other end of the continuum, he compared their genomes to that of terriers. These are small dogs, they're feisty, they're energetic, they're aggressive, they're annoying. They were bred um, originally to, to hunt vermin. So we had whole genomes sequenced from 21 sport hunting breeds and 28 terrier breeds. Now when we compared their genomes, what do you think we were going to find? What is the most important thing in separating these dogs from these dogs? I thought it was their brains, actually. I thought that, well, it's got to be genes important in their nervous system because, you know, these dogs are focused, they're trained, they're athletic, um, we've used them for our survival. You know, these dogs were bred to hunt vermin, but, you know, they're just kind of these hyperactive, yippy yappy, unfocused um, sort of dogs. And it turns out I was absolutely wrong. So I apologize, this table is kind of busy, but all you really have to look at are the names of these genes and then look over here and see what these genes do. They're all genes that are important in blood flow, in endurance, in cardiac development. They're all important making these, these, these sport hunting dogs athletes. So you had to have the right form, the right raw material before anything else. So these genes do things like um, are important in vascular muscle contraction, in helping the, the muscle fibers bind, controlling the resting heart rate, controlling the muscles um, that are in the skeleton. And it turned out to be much more important to have your body be correct than your brain correct. So brawn over brains. That's the take home message there. Now we, we decided to look a little closer at this and so we went down to the racetracks. Don't tell NIH we did this. But we went to the racetracks and we got samples from whippets, who are racing dogs in the United States. And we found that two genes, one called TRPM3, it's important in, in vascular, so, so blood vessel cell contraction, and another gene called myostatin, which is important in how big your muscles are. Those two genes alone count for 24% of racing speed. So two genes, if you got the right two variants for two genes, that accounts for 24% of how good of a racer you are. So I figure if science doesn't work out for me, I can go ahead and start breeding whippets because I know exactly what I need to do. And, and we also looked at agility. And so agility is a way of racing forward, jumping through an obstacle, racing to the side, jumping over an obstacle, and the dogs are scored on how well they perform the tasks as well as how fast they go. And again, there's really one gene that's really important, RYR3, and this is a gene that's really important in contracting your skeletal muscles. And if you think about what these dogs do, run, contract, race, jump, over, under, um, that really makes sense. So this is a really interesting example, a very small number of genes responsible for these seemingly very complex phenotypes or traits. We did see some surprises, and one was a gene called CDH23. Now I automatically, I immediately recognize this gene because when it's mutated in humans, it causes something called Usher's syndrome. So people who have Usher's syndrome have a variety of developmental delays, but they also have problems in hearing, okay? Uh, they have what's called vestibular reflexia, so they, they can't really hear um, very well. Um, sounds are sort of dumbed down for them, so they're not loud, loud like they would be if I were to yell right now. And we found this mutation, but we only found it in the sport hunting dogs. We didn't find it in any other mammal that we looked at or any other dog breed that we looked at. And we did various analysis which showed that this is definitely a mutation. It's going to change what the protein can do. So why would hunting dogs want to have their hearing turned down? 
gun dogs, right? You don't want them to get really startled when the gun goes off. So if the gun goes off and they go like a terrier, that's not good, right? Because then all the geese and the, and the ducks are all going to fly away. So it looks like what's happened is there's been selection to keep they can hear, but it keeps their hearing turned down so that they have a very, slow, a very low startle reflex. What dog breeds have the highest startle reflex? The terriers. They're the ones that run around and go rah, 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 no matter what happens. So we're, we're following up on this. It's some interesting, um, interesting data. So when we think about behavior, as a human geneticist, I'm really excited because what we're starting to see over and over is that if you have a really small mutation in a gene, it can cause variation in behavior in dogs, between dog breeds. But when you have mutations, big mutations, big kill the gene mutations in, in humans, then you get really significant disease and we get syndromes. And there's other examples of that that we've been, we've been working on recently. So dogs are, this study shows, a really good system to study athletic performance. And you know, when we first published this data, I got phone calls from reporters because it was an Olympic year asking me if athletes should be tested and then they should perform or race in different categories depending on what their genetics was. Well, no, because there's hundreds of genes that contribute to making you a good or a bad or a poor or mediocre or whatever kind of athlete. But it was interesting that that's what people immediately thought. The last thing I'd say about behavior is we've identified a set of genes that are under very strong selection for improving cardiac function. So you want to improve cardiac function, boom, these are the five genes you change. Does that mean that these are the genes we should be targeting to develop therapies for people with heart disease? I don't know, that's something to think about. All right, so the other thing that we'd like to think about when we think about dog breeds is morphology. And this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, it, it's um, the cover of Science and it's a paper that we published in Science identifying the first major gene controlling body size in dogs. And um, this is a harlequin, Great Dane, and um, what's this? Yeah, right, so this is a, a little chihuahua here. And keep in mind, they can be crossed to produce fertile offspring because they're members of the same species. Think about how that should go <laughs> if you're going to do that. All right, so I don't have time to talk about body size, but I did want you to know that we found genes for, for skeletal size, weight, and height genes that control the shape of the skull, legs that are long or short, coat color. I'll talk about cancer in a minute. And then fur, so the texture of the fur, the length of the fur, whether or not your dog has those mustaches and eyebrows like you see in a schnauzer. We found all of those genes. And really, it's a pretty small number of genes that account for the differences between these two dogs. Now that's extraordinary because if you think about humans, the difference between being five foot five and six foot five is 1,500 genes. 1,500 genes contribute or control that variation in height. In dogs, four papers here, it's really only a couple dozen. So we have a great system here for understanding genetics of anything we care about in mammalian biology, in this case, in growth regulation, which of course we care about in human health and human biology as well. Now when we think about growth regulation and how that relates to disease, the very first thing we always think about is cancer. Because cancer is a disease of growth regulation that's gone wrong. So on this particular slide, I've listed for you the 10 top diseases in dogs. Cancer's at the top. One in four dogs are gonna die of cancer, which is the same number of humans who will get cancer in their lifetimes as well. 
And these are all things you probably recognize, heart disease, eye disease, cataracts, epilepsy. And that's because dogs get all the same diseases as humans do. And as we find the genes that cause those diseases in dogs, we're learning something about ourselves and our health as well. So if you think about cancer, let's talk about just a couple examples. Osteosarcoma, cancer in the long bones. Well, we see it in the Scottish Deerhound, we see it in the Irish Wolfhound, the Great Dane, and the Rottweiler. So dogs that have these very long legs. Bladder cancer, well, we see that in a bunch of terriers, the Scottish Terriers and the West Highland White Terriers, as well as in the Shetland Sheepdogs. Histiocytic sarcoma, that's a terrible disease. 25% of Bernese Mountain Dogs will die of that disease, and 25% of flat-coated retrievers will die of the same disease. There's a Bernese Mountain Dog here. They're a beautiful, beautiful breed. You know, we only see it in a very few breeds, so it's a chance for us to find those genes, which we're working on in my lab, and then translate those findings to human histiocytic sarcoma diseases. And the last one is gastric cancer. We see that in Belgian breeds, like the Belgian Tavern and the Belgian Sheepdog, and we also see it in the Chow Chow, which is shown for you here. Now, if you don't know, in humans, gastric cancer is highly lethal. People rarely survive it. In dogs, it is 100% lethal, and the average amount of time from diagnosis to death is 17 days, 17 days. It's diagnosed pretty late in, in the disease course, and then it goes on and, and the dogs sadly die of it pretty quickly. So we're studying all of these in my lab, and at the end of the talk, I'm gonna put up some information, because if you have dogs who have these diseases, or you know someone who does, if they're healthy dogs or affected dogs, then we wanna to talk to you, and we wanna include some of your samples in our data set. But in the last story that I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you about something that I call the long and lonely life of a canine transmissible tumor. So this is work we published about a year and a half ago. So what the heck is a canine transmissible tumor? Well, this is a tumor that exists in dogs and the only way they get it is they catch it from another dog via sexual transmission, um, I suppose they could get it by biting and things like that as well, but generally by sexual transmission. So it goes from dog to dog to dog to dog. And it's really a contagious cancer. One dog passes it to the next, who passes it to the next, who passes it to the next. There's no virus associated with it. There's no prion, if you've studied prions. Um, there's no bacteria, it's truly an infectious cancer. And the only other infectious cancer that we know about in mammals is in Tasmanian devils. And that's the reason Tasmanian devils are nearly extinct, because they have one of these infectious cancers as well. Now, the dog tumor is the world's oldest known tumor, and it's been continuously propagated dog to dog to dog to dog to dog for thousands of years. It's endemic absolutely everywhere in the world except for Antarctica. We've never seen one there. Now, all of these tumors have a shared origin. So there's pretty good evidence that there was one dog 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, and he got or she got this tumor. And then all the dogs that have it today when we look at their tumor, they're actually very similar in terms of DNA sequence, telling us that they all share something, and that is they all share that original tumor that, that initially started this whole mess five or 10,000 years ago. So we asked the question of whether or not studying the genome of these tumors could reveal the biological mechanisms that underlie the tumor's dogged perseverance in canines around the world today. So if we look at the sequence of those A's and T's and C's and G's and 38 chromosomes, would we be able to understand why this tumor has been so, so successful for thousands and thousands of years? So the story goes like this. Here's our original dog 10,000 years ago. Mm, he got the tumor, too bad for him. 
It's a myeloid tumor, so it's a white cell kind of tumor. And then thousands of years go by, and lots of things happen. Well, he has some lineages that just die out. He has some that go for a few generations and die out. Um, he has some that continue on until today. So when we did this experiment, we only had two things, and that is we had the sequence of a tumor from Brazil, not of the dog it was found in, but just of the tumor, and the genome sequence of a tumor of a dog that was from Australia. So using just that data, could we figure out what this tumor had done that had made it so successful to spread all the way around the world? And the answer is we actually can. So if we look at just the sequence of the tumor, it's got a lot of stuff in it, right? It's got the mutations called somatic mutations that I actually care about. These are the things that has made the tumor so successful. It's going to have DNA from the ancient dog from 10,000 years ago. It's going to have DNA sequence in it from whatever dog came into the clinic with the tumor. And then it's going to have a variety of other things that are just going to make the whole data set a big mess. But remember, I have two dogs, so I can eliminate a lot of the confusing things that exist. And I can pretty much be left with two things. DNA sequence from that 10,000-year-old founder, I don't know what breed he is, and then the DNA sequence of the tumor, which I want to look at, again, to figure out why it's been so successful. So how am I going to do that? How am I going to separate those two things? Well. Key to this has been a consortium that Bob Wayne at UCLA and myself and Yaping Zhang from Chinese Academy of Sciences have formed. And within the next five years, we are sequencing 10,000 canine genomes. 10,000 canine genomes. We have um, invited 18 labs from nine different countries to join this consortium. And really, the main thing that's missing from our consortium are scientists and DNA samples from Mexico. So that's one of the reasons I'm hoping some people will come forward with samples. If you want your dog's DNA to get sequenced, I can probably make that happen for you. All right, so how does that help us? Well, here's our founder with his tumor, and then here are the two dogs that walked into my clinic. I have the sequence of their tumors. Now, if I just look at this one dog, there's millions and millions of those SNV, single nucleotide variants. It's the same thing as a SNP. There's insertions and deletions, and there's places where the structure of the DNA has gotten messed up. But now I can compare the sequence of these two dogs, and I can get rid of a lot of that. And then I take the remaining information, and I simply say, is it found in my Ostrander lab catalog of whole genome sequences? And if it is, well, that's DNA sequence from the dog. If it's not, then it's DNA sequence from the actual tumor. So remember, my catalog has thousands of dogs whole genome sequence in it. So that means whatever this dog is, bits and pieces of them are sitting in my computers in the lab. And so if I answer yes, then I know it's DNA sequence from the dog. If I answer no, then it's got to be DNA sequence from the tumor. Finally, I have the DNA sequence of just the tumor. I've pulled all the other stuff away from it. And now I can say, why has this tumor been so successful? How did it make its way all the way around the world? Is this something that could happen in humans? Could we have infectious cancers? All right, well, let's look. So here is a big, messy picture of your immune system, all righty? It turns out when we look at where mutations have, have occurred in our tumor, they've occurred basically every single solitary place that is important for your immune system recognizing something is bad. Every one of those has been knocked out. Every gene has been knocked out, and every pathway has been knocked out. So the tumor has been really successful because your immune system doesn't know it's a tumor. The dog's immune system doesn't even know it's a tumor. 
And so it's been able to propagate around the world because the tumor has knocked every single one of these things out. Now, when I, um, when Brennan Decker, who did this work in my lab, first came to me and showed me this data, I said, wow, you know, this is really cool. By the way, thinking back to the beginning of the talk when we talked about breeds and breed origins and how breeds were formed, what breed was that very first dog from 10,000 years ago? And he said, I don't know. He's a graduate student, I don't know. And I said, I want to know. And he said, no, I don't care. And I said, see, that's where you're wrong because I'm not gonna let you graduate until you figure it out. And so he used all the information and all the techniques that I've told you about, and he actually figured it out. So what he did is he took DNA sequence from, I don't know, maybe 100 dogs that we had DNA sequence from. So we know every A and T and C and G in every single one of their chromosomes. And he put them on this wheel that Heidi Parker had constructed, showing how the breeds relate one to another. And then he took the DNA sequence from the two tumors and he put it on the wheel as well. And it turns out that the founder is genetically most similar to the modern Siberian Husky. So the modern Siberian Husky was that original dog who got that original tumor several thousand years ago. So this is, this is really cool for a couple of reasons. So not only can I tell you what breeds or go into making up mixed breed dogs, and not only can I now tell you how different breeds were formed and, and when, but I can tell you stuff that happened thousands of years ago to a single dog. And I can do that because of the power of genomics. Once I have the genome sequenced, so I know everything there is to know about all those chromosomes from 1,000 dogs, there's pretty much nothing that I'm not gonna be able to tell you about any dog you wanna ask me about. So then I let Brennan graduate, by the way, and he's now at Harvard doing a fellowship, and yeah, he's brilliant, blah, 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 okay. So how can you help us? Well, there's lots of ways that you can help us. So we study histiocytic sarcoma in Bernie's Mountain Dogs, flat-coated retrievers, bladder cancer in Scottish Terriers, West Highland White Terriers, and Shelties. We study gastric cancer in the Belgian Travern, Sheepdog, and Chow Chow. And I don't have any dogs from Mexico that are either healthy or are affected with these diseases. Really need to get some. We're interested in traits like body size, skull shape, and bone structure. And so if you've got a dog breed that's a little unusual, people don't really know that much about, you think is kind of cool, well, I'll tell you how to contact us because we want to hear from you and we want to put your dog in our study. And if your dog is cool enough, we'll actually sequence its whole genome for you. And then that data will become available to everyone in the world so everyone in the world can study your dog. So keep that in mind. And, and led by Heidi Parker in the lab, we're ever interested in how dog breeds relate one to another. And, and especially these rare and unusual breeds like the Beaver Terrier. It was great that we had one. It's the only reason we could figure out um, that Ice Princess was a Beaver Terrier. So if you have an unusual breed or you know someone who does, I know that Heidi and Dana Drager in the lab are very interested in adding your dog to that giant wheel of life, as we call it. So we have time for questions. What I hope I've told you um, or convinced you of is that dogs are a great system to study simple and complex traits, including disease. Canine morphology is so much fun to study and it illuminates genes and pathways that are important in understanding human health and human biology. And most phenotypes, and phenotypes is just another word for trait, are controlled by a small number of genes that have a really big effect. And that makes sense since we know dogs were only domesticated a few thousand years ago. Mixed breed dogs, I can actually figure out pretty well what the components of your mixed breed dog are. But it's important that if, if you really want to know about that, you don't get distracted by the three biggies, which are coat color and coat length and body size. Because if you have a lot of things contributing, your dog can look almost 
any different way um, that you can imagine. And finally, um, behavior, especially behaviors that are associated with breeds, they've co-evolved with our needs. We need dogs that herd. We need dogs that guarded our flocks. We needed dogs to help us hunt. And so as we study human behavior and human evolution, we're studying canine evolution and canine behavior as well. So we'll have time for questions. Um, I wanted to put this up here and I'm gonna leave it up here. This is my favorite picture of a gray wolf this week. Um, if you have samples or you wanna get in touch with us, you can call Andrew Hogan in my lab. Um, this is his email. You can go to the dog genome um, email site and you can also go to our website and there's a way to contact us through the website. And I'll leave those up and I'll take questions. Sí, creo que enseguida le podemos dar un micrófono. Gracias. Eh, ¿Qué tal? Buenas noches. Eh, doctor Lascano, otra vez una felicitación, doctora. Esta exposición como que abre más el espectro, ¿no? Eh, un comentario y a la par de ello, una pregunta. Bueno, he tenido perros desde que soy infante, tengo 41 años, y pienso que si usted viene a México, le adelanto que la supervivencia de esta especie en México ha sido la ambiental. Hay muchos perros en la calle, ¿no? todos los perros que yo he tenido han sido adoptados de la calle. Son unos verdaderos guerreros, ¿eh? cuando se ponen con razas de, como usted llamó, finas tal vez, ¿no? Sobreviven más estos por las condiciones, las circunstancias ambientales, ¿no? Los he visto tomar agua de la lluvia mezclada con aceite, los he visto comer chetos, los he visto comer ratas, ¿no? Entonces, se lo adelanto. Por otra parte, creo que también la manera fundamental en cómo los animales caninos han eh, sobrevivido, pues también ha tenido que ver con esta mancuerna con los seres humanos, ¿no? o sea, esta compatibilidad que he tenido con nosotros les ha mantenido la supervivencia, cosa que otras especies no. Por ejemplo, está Elizabeth Col Colbert, ella creo que es estadounidense. Perdón, ¿podría en aras del tiempo hacer la pregunta? Bueno, eh, eso es nada más, que si conoce la, la investigación de Elizabeth Colbert, la sexta extinción de las especies, si conoce esa investigación y si hay alguien investigando acerca del, de, del, del genoma y del porqué de la situación de esta sexta extinción de las especies. Esa es la pregunta nada más. Gracias. So, if I understand your question, you're, you're asking me, is somebody studying the genetics of the, the human-dog bond um, in, in the human genome and in the dog genome? And have we, have we been able to figure out how that has evolved? And, and no, I mean, what we know is that dogs have been under selection by humans for our survival, that we have selected very hard for genes that are important for our own survival. And then all the other complexities of relationship have grown out of that. The affection, the adoration, all of those things. But we don't really know what those genes are yet. Don David, sí. Bueno, doctora, este, primera que nada quiero felicitarla, una gran charla. Eh, en México hemos notado algunos problemas con el tumor venéreo transmisible. Se sabe que hay unos tratamientos de quimioterapia, eh, poliquimioterapia o quimioterapia metronómica que por supuesto que acaban con la vida de este tumor. Sin embargo, también hemos notado 
que ciertas variedades del tumor venéreo transmisible son resistentes a la quimioterapia. Eh, se sabe que existe alguna variedad o dentro de los estudios que ha hecho que sean resistentes a la quimioterapia o a qué se debe este efecto, si usted conoce ese problema. Gracias. So, maybe I, I wasn't completely clear. There's no virus associated with these transmissible tumors. No bacteria, no virus, no prion. So, things like the Tasmanian devil tumor or the canine venereal transmissible tumor, there's no virus. This is, this, no, there's no EBV, there's no papilloma virus. So, it's usually treated by just cutting the tumor out because the tumor is pretty big and ugly. And, and so that's what veterinarians um, usually do with it. Owners don't usually choose to have chemotherapy for the kinds of tumors that I talked about. For other kinds of cancer, yes, there's, there's chemotherapy. And you're absolutely right that resistance to various chemotherapies are developing for lots of different kinds of cancer. And it's probably for the same reasons it happens in humans. The cancer gets smart. It figures out how to, how to work its way around the chemotherapy or avoid the chemotherapy. And so what we have to do is develop new chemotherapies. But the other thing we have to do is find the genes that allow the tumor to do that, that make the tumor that smart. And that's a big area of research in all of cancer genetics today. Don Omar, sí, por favor. Gracias. Este, mi pregunta es, este, más o menos, ¿en cuánto tiempo el perro podrá andar? ¿En cuánto tiempo, perdón? ¿En cuánto tiempo en un perro, los perros podrán andar? O sea, ¿Andar? caminar, sí, caminar, caminar, sí. Eh, ya ¿Cómo? caminan, en cuatro o patas. Los... Hay otra pregunta por acá, me ah. parece. How long does it take to walk a... On, on two legs, so I answer very rapidly. They already walk on four legs. Oh, yeah. Dogs walk on four legs. I don't, I don't think they're interested in walking on two legs. That's for us. Doctora Strander, yo tengo una duda en relación con este síndrome que usted presentó de el similar al humano síndrome de Usher, con hipoacusia sensorineural y con problema vestibular. Me gustaría saber si el gene que ustedes involucran como causal es idéntico o similar al humano, para qué proteína codifica y en qué células de porque son dos partes del, del oído interno, el vestíbulo y la parte sensorineural. Entonces, ¿qué gene es similar o idéntico al humano y para qué proteína codifica? Yeah. So for the hunting dogs, the, the protein is CDH23. And this is a, a gene that we know when it's mutated in humans causes Usher syndrome, as I said, and that there are a lot of other things. We don't really know anything else about that in dogs. This is a new finding. It's not published yet. So this is very early, early stages in trying to figure out exactly what's going on in dogs with this protein. Doctora, si me este favor, ¿cómo se imagina, cómo se imagina, repito, cómo se imagina que los lobos se domesticaron? Yo observo que en los zoológicos hay lobos y es imposible domesticarlos. Echemos la imaginación, ¿cómo se imagina que se domesticaron hace miles de años los, los lobos? So, so we, we really don't think of wolves as tamed, we think of domesticated. So they were critical for our survival. So we had to bring them close to us and they had to guard our sheep, but not eat them. They had to move our flock, but not chase them away. They had to point and hunt, but they couldn't eat the ducks or the geese. 
And so wolves that came in close to human society um, that didn't seem to be very aggressive, those are the ones that people first began domesticating and training. And truthfully, if we couldn't do it, then that group of people died out. So there was very, very, very strong selection over thousands of years in order to do that. Evolution thousands of years is a tiny, tiny time. But if you compare it to going to the zoo and spending a couple weeks and trying to tame a wolf, well, that's not gonna happen. It's still a wolf. And it's still got all of those wolf genes in it. And it doesn't yet have any of those domestic dog variants in it. Por favor. Doctora, muchas felicidades por su fascinante plática. Yo tengo dos preguntas. Una es, ¿qué nos podría decir sobre el origen de los perros mesoamericanos? Y si todavía existen eh, genes, genomas presentes en las razas modernas. Eh, otro es, si consideramos a la misma raza de, eh, de estos per los perros modernos en diferentes países, ¿estos perros son iguales o podemos hablar de estirpes nacionales de perros de razas específicas? Yeah, so your, your second question first. And so we have done the experiment where we have collected DNA from dogs of the same breed from, for instance, the United States and Europe. And we have compared them. And there are some differences for some breeds. Sometimes they separate and we can, we can tell they're different. Other times they're so intermingled they really look the same. It's an important question because when we study diseases, we often collect samples from, for instance, the US and Europe. And, and we need both of those data sets to find all the genes. No one data set is really powerful enough. So for every cancer we study, we're reaching out to people all over the world asking us to send them both healthy and affected dogs. Um, in, in terms of South America, most of the work that's been done has been on street dogs, as was referred to before. And it's been done by a scientist at Cornell, Adam Boyko. And most of what he's been doing is just been looking at the migration of dogs um, throughout the regions. Truthfully, we don't have nearly enough dogs from the Southern Hemisphere um, to say very much from South America, from Mexico. We, we really just don't have enough dogs. We don't have, most breeds are not represented. Very few samples for those that are, and that's why, again, we're reaching out here today. Don Omar, por favor. Buenas noches. Um, en relación con el comentario que hizo la persona que hizo la primera pregunta, en relación a a los perros callejeros, no sé cuál sea el porcentaje de perros callejeros en los lugares en donde se han recogido, eh, las, las razas en donde, con las que se hicieron los estudios, pero la pregunta es si hay prueba científica de que los perros que, son, que tienen una, una mezcla mayor de razas para dar, para dar como resultado pues, ese perro, son más resistentes o, o presentan un un menor, una, una mayor resistencia a, a estas enfermedades que vienen de, de, de la genética de las razas específicas o si tienen una, una presencia, digamos, como pareja en general? So, so that's a great question. And so essentially, if you get a mutt or a mixed breed dog, is there going to be hybrid vigor? Is your dog going to be healthier than a purebred dog where there have been closely related individuals who've been crossed one to another in order to get a line of dogs with a particular appearance or a particular behavior? And the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no, because it depends what was crossed to make your dog. So for instance, if you crossed a, a Labrador retriever um, with a German Shepherd, and you have this very pretty mixed breed dog, it's still gonna get hip dysplasia because both of those parent breeds have really, really high rates of hip dysplasia. If you were to cross a Bernese Mountain dog and a flat-coated retriever, 
they're gonna get histiocytic sarcoma, cancer, because both those breeds have such a high rate. So it really depends on what the crosses were that were done to create your particular dog or your breed. We do know that among purebreds, small dogs live much longer than large dogs. There are stories of the toy dogs living into their 20s, whereas these big breeds, the Newfoundlands, the Great Danes, the Irish Wolfhounds, you know, those dogs live to be nine, 10, maybe if you're lucky, 11, but they can easily die as early as six, seven, or eight. So that's an important consideration when you think about these so-called village dogs or, or street dogs, because again, a lot depends on what originally went into them to, to make them up. And, and so the characteristics that village dogs have in Brazil may be very different than what they have in Nicaragua. It really depends on what the breeds were that went into their original creation. They're not generally protected. They're not generally cared for. They've had to survive by being smart and being able to get food. So they're gonna probably live a lot longer than a very foo-foo-y purebred dog <laughs> is gonna live um, because they've had to over several generations. A mí, a mí me gustaría agregar que por cada perro callejero vivo adulto que vemos, debe haber atrás 18 perritos que se murieron en el camino. Ahí hay un efecto de selección muy fuerte. Sí. Doctor, precisamente sobre eso que comenta sobre los, eh, los, los perros callejeros eh, urbanos, eh, se habla de que en la Ciudad de México, como, como en las grandes ciudades, ya tenemos casi, casi una rata por cada ser humano. Casi, casi, ¿no? Eh, ¿Cuál es el equilibrio que pudiéramos eh, tener que buscar para que no haya tanto eh, perro en la calle? Porque tenemos miles, ¿no? Que también contaminan, ¿no? So the question is, what can be done to reduce the number of street dogs? So it, it really comes down to food. These dogs tend to hang out where there's garbage. Um, so that they can eat, and that's pretty much what they think about all day, is where's the food gonna come from. And so removing um, those sources of food um, is, is certainly gonna reduce the number of dogs, you know, puppies aren't gonna live, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm, I don't know a lot about population control and street dogs. I, my work is really focused on disease and cancer and, and purebred dogs. Aquí quisiera yo agregar que hay una política muy establecida en algunos países asiáticos en donde eh, los perros callejeros se les pone un collar, se recogen, se les pone un collar, se les esteriliza, se les desinfecta y luego se vuelven a soltar. Con, en el barrio de donde los recogieron, porque finalmente terminan siendo parte de la comunidad, adoptados por la comunidad, ¿no? Eh, yeah, I, I have a question myself, but lo voy a, lo voy a preguntar en español. Eh, ¿Cuántas de las mutaciones que tienen así muy establecidas son defectos pleiotrópicos? How many of the mutations… They have identified, they actually do have a pleiotropic… Oh, how many of the mutations we found… Um, actually are responsible for defects. So, multiple, like pleiotropic effects, like multiple effects on many different traits. Oh, so how many mutations have we found that affect multiple different things? So probably m most of them so far. So we haven't always looked carefully, but when we have, we find things. So for instance, we found a mutation in a gene called kit ligand and it, it's responsible for cancer of the digits in several breeds, including the standard poodle. Why is it even there? Well, the same gene makes standard poodles dark, dark, dark black. And in a dog show, the dogs who win are the black, black, black dogs. Not the gray black, not the model black, not the kind of black, it's the very dark black. So the same mutation or the same variant does both things. It makes the dogs very, very black, but because the gene has lots of other purposes, it also increases their risk dramatically for getting cancer of the toes. Thank you. Por favor, sí. Si. 
Eh, bueno, en relación con una de las preguntas que hizo uno de los asistentes, eh, seguramente la doctora no ha podido tener acceso al perro nuestro mexicano, el perro calvo, que era tan importante en las culturas prehispánicas del altiplano. Entonces, este síndrome de este animal es muy similar, casi idéntico al síndrome humano de alopecia completa, que en el humano se transmite como autosómico recesivo, pero posiblemente en este perro nuestro, que ahorita se me va el nombre de como si alguien se acuerda. Cholos Quintle. El Cholos Quintle, bueno, ok. Entonces, posiblemente aquí se depuró una línea y o se hizo una transmisión autosómica dominante o bueno, ya no había más que ese tipo de perros que obviamente al cruzarse pues daban esto. En el humano, repito, es autosómico recesivo, la, el síndrome de alopecia total. Yeah. So, the, the so-called Mexican hairless dog, those, the, the DNA mutations responsible for that trait has in fact been, been identified and published. And there are several other kinds of, of hairless dogs in the United States. The newest breed actually is the, um, a hairless terrier. And for all of those breeds, or for most of them, the mutations, in fact, have been identified at this point. Y hay tiempo para una última, una última pregunta más que voy a hacer yo, si me lo permiten. <laughs> este, do we know the level of breeds among wolves? Oh, so it's a good question. How are wolves divided into breeds? So it's clear that there are different populations of wolves around the world, and it's also clear that they, they look different and they have somewhat different behaviors. And so as we move around the Middle East and um, Siberia and um, the United States and South America, there are absolutely different populations. I don't know that anyone has put a number on how many there are, and I don't think people quite are quite ready to call them breeds um, because they've been kept very isolated and there's a lot that we don't know about them yet. But you know, there are some wolves that are, you know, this big in the Middle East. They're really small, actually. And then of course there are wolves that are absolutely huge. So we have a lot left to learn about wolves. Thank you so much. Bien, eh, con esta última pregunta yo quisiera agradecerles a todos ustedes la fidelidad con la que han eh, asistido muchos, muchos de ustedes, veo muchos rostros conocidos, a toda la serie de conferencias que hemos tenido a lo largo de esta serie de los viernes de, de la evolución. Eh, repetir que el próximo año, probablemente en noviembre, porque es una manera de celebrar el cumpleaños de la do doctora Ostrander, la invitaremos de nueva cuenta para tener una mesa redonda ahora sobre la genética y la, evolu la evolución de los cholos quintles. Eh, y eh, eh, por último, eh, invitarlos a que asistan a todas las actividades que hace el Colegio Nacional, que como todos ustedes saben, eh, va a continuar con una serie de charlas y eventos, aunque el día de hoy sí terminamos con la serie de los Viernes de Evolución. A nombre del doctor Sarucán, a nombre propio, a nombre del Colegio Nacional, les quiero dar las gracias por su asistencia, pero sobre todo le quiero dar las gracias a la doctora Ostrander y a la doctora Parker por la manera tan generosa y amable en que aceptaron la invitación de venir a México. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess it's time to the question from the...